everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. Today, I've got a very special episode for you. I know I've been missing an action for the last week. I've been out of town, but I wanted to get a fun one out before we finish up our uh, uh, expose on the Roman Catholic Church, getting into the uh, the Tudors, which is going to be a very bloody uh, exploration. But I wanted to do something fun with horror. Uh, and I have here my friend, Brentley from the Dangerous Rhetoric podcast and YouTube channel. And we're going to talk about LGBTQ plus or the premium pack, as you guys know that I like to refer to it as a representation in horror because both of us are a member of that community and we're also huge horror nuts. So we just wanted to jump in here and uh, talk about it. But first, uh, Brentley, introduce yourself. Tell, tell the subscribers about your, uh, your podcast and where to find you. Um, yeah, I'm Brentley. I, uh, I am on the Dangerous Rhetoric podcast, which I normally co-host with my partner and my boyfriend, Daniel. He's taking a little break, so I've been doing it solo for like a time being. But yeah, it's uh, Dangerous Rhetoric. You can find it uh, if you just search for Dangerous Rhetoric and look for Joe Biden sniffing a cat while a cartoon dog looks on disapprovingly. Um, and then, yeah, I'm on Twitter at Kapopolis because now I'm on my, like, I'm on my like, third Twitter account <laughs> It's Twitter hate. getting banned. <laughs> uh, the first one was banned. The second one we got I got locked out of it uh, because Twitter won't let me appeal a report, and uh, so I'm locked out of it. So I made a third one. <laughs> so <laughs> it's funny. It's don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, I, uh, we do like some political analysis, cultural analysis. We talk to people from all over the political spectrum, um, get a lot of different perspectives uh, from musicians to um, detransitioners to other uh, podcasters. So we talk to a lot of different people um, and we just try to keep it fun and interesting. We do like a, it's usually like a weekly or biweekly show. It depends on who's available and uh, when the schedules line up, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. I love movies. I've been, you know, obsessed with films ever since I was a kid growing up in the eighties. Um, my most favorite film of all time is aliens, the sequel 1986. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like, I really like the original one too. Uh, cause that one actually has more of a horror film, whereas yeah. like the second one's more of like an action horror, mm -hmm. uh, but they had a bigger budget so they could actually do yeah. it. Um, but yeah, no, I love I love horror films. Uh, really interested to hang out and then talk and see, uh, you know, what are some of your favorite films? And because uh, gay representation in film is something that's sort of like becoming more and more mainstream now, and it's almost becoming like overbearing, like to the point where like I just wish they would have had like a gay character in a film every once in a while. And now mm -hmm. it's just like they have movies where it's just like, where's the straight person? Like they're gone. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I have the same thoughts. Uh, Everybody deserves to be represented in every genre, but it has to be done correctly and done written. You can't just yeah. create a character who is obviously from the char character of makeup is not gay and then turn them gay just to say you have a gay character. That's where I have issues with it. So it's... Or when you're and there's a deck, you got, you know, like a whole cast of like, you know, gay, 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 lesbian, you know, this, the other. It does, it's not representative of the population okay. at all. No, it's not. Not if you're trying to appeal to everyone, unless you're trying to do niche movies, which are, which is fine if you are, but then you need to advertise it that way and not try to cram it down a mainstream audience's throat because it just doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. One way I, I speaking of ways that I think it does work, uh, you know, the new It movie that mm -hmm. came out a few years ago, you know, they got a lot of flack for having the, you know, the monster kill the gay people. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I was actually like, oh, I feel included. Like the monster's <laughs> killing us too. Like, and you know, like they had, they showed the like little gay bash scene in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought that was all kind of well done and appropriate, you know, and people got upset about it. And I was like, they are including us, you know, <laughs> like, like why? It's fair game. It's like, well, we took the pressure off African-Americans for a minute because it's usually African-Americans that get killed in the first 30 minutes of a, a horror movie and that is not a racist thing it's the truth go watch any horror film and the black characters are gone within 30 minutes and i don't know why <laughs> it's up to the director and the and the, the writer i guess <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um but yeah um absolutely and 
another thing uh, that we'll probably touch on is there seems to be this whole like outrage if they make a gay or transgender or any other sort of LGBT plus character the murder. And I'm just like, or the or the killer. And I'm like, why not? We're we're capable of the same kind of feelings and impulses as any other person. Why wouldn't you want to make us a killer as long as it's well written? What what does it matter? I mean, yeah. also Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most famous serial killers of all time and infamously targeted, you know, other young homosexual men mm-hmm. and got um, a yeah, John Wayne Gacy, who it was yep. sort of loosely based on, who Pennywise was simply based on, dressed up like a clown, was closeted gay, and went after young boys. He was, I guess, you, I don't know if you'd call him more gay or a pedophile. Not that the, the two are not mutually <laughs> exclusive. Don't don't take it that way. But he he yeah yeah. Yeah, the predator. The predators tend to like even. It, it's hard to consider a predator you know gay or straight because they yeah. target young men or young women because generally it's, it's they have a you know like they're just looking to destroy the target so it's mm-hmm. not necessarily a sexual thing at all um exactly. and a lot of times the psychopaths too and, and sociopaths to some extent don't necessarily have a like sexual orientation and will almost exclusively use sex as sort of like a power thing Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one thing that you know infamously like the psychopaths especially they can you know be gay or straight as long as it's uh you know advantageous to them and what they want out of the situation absolutely uh, interesting to say that because sex has always been construed with power if uh, i'm a big history buff and i go back and read about the vikings and the romans and you know the spartans what happened when they conquered a people they took their women and children prisoner and they assaulted and killed the men because it was a power play. And that's not a gay thing. It's not a straight thing. It's a power thing. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. But it's, uh, I don't know, some other films. I'm trying to think where else, like what's in a good major mainstream film where we've had some gay representation that wasn't like obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to go back to the history, I, I read an interesting essay Um that talked about how the parallels between horror and the gay experience are pretty prevalent. You know, often they're outcasts, they're looked down upon in society, at least at at one point in history. And I can really see that. But um, in the first time I remember openly that were obviously gay uh, characters were in the films of Alfred Hitchcock. And before that, it might've been sort of subtle that they were there, but the film uh, Rope, from 1948, um, it was actually based on a real life murder that happened in Chicago in the 20s where a gay couple uh, kidnapped and murdered a 14 year old boy just to see if they could get away with it. Wow. And that's essentially the premise of Rope except they it's two college students that murder a classmate to see if they can get away with it. And then it, it turns out it's kind of a psychological thriller. It all takes part in their apartment. They had the body under uh, in a chest underneath the table at a dinner party they're giving so there's all these people around and it kind of spirals into this ca- uh telltale heart kind of care where they're starting to get guilty and they you know they start to give themselves away but that's uh the most that's the first most obvious representation of gay that i remember in any horror movie. i'm shocked it's that early you said 1948 1948 wow. they never really came right out and said that they were gay but uh, the sexual tension is there the two actors are openly gay it's you know the tension is there and it was based on a murder that included a gay couple so it doesn't take two plus two equals four right <laughs> it's still it's still uh it's pretty it's it's early i'm surprised yeah hitchcock did that quite a bit now there's hitchcock i don't think was a nice good person but i love his work he often did that I think to antagonize people there's you know not only he had a history of antagonizing his actors uh, bringing out anything that was not normal about them the the fisher of the female and he also had a habit of doing that with actors he knew was gay knew were gay so I'm sure it was done maliciously but it's still it's still a good movie (laughs) you know whatever his motivations yeah well I mean it's uh it's hard to say without being there right but it's interesting that that's the way he plays it yeah and then after that i guess the next would be psycho 
the most obvious representation transgender representation that I that I can recall even though I don't really consider Norman Bates transgender but I think a lot of people left that movie thinking that he was any any thoughts on that I don't know I mean I, I don't think I would cons I never even would think about I never thought of him in, the, in those terms <laughs> but now it's like thinking back you know on it and today it's like it's like is he trans or is he like you know totally just broken or is that you know is that saying something more deep about you know people who have really extreme gender dysphoria mm -hmm. it, it, there's a lot there like i don't because i know a lot of people that have experienced gender dysphoria that we've spoken to on the channel uh they have trauma there's a trauma component there mm -hmm. um and untangling that is the work of you know years mm -hmm. uh, or a lifetime and so if there's like that and they put they put them you know they put you in the funnel to the gender bending then that's when you get you know the the, the trans outcome but it's like in norman bates's case he's this character that's definitely got the trauma and, yep. <laughs> and he's like definitely gender bending but he's not getting the help that he needs yep. so it's 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 complicated it's an interesting I, I don't know we don't think about him in those terms and maybe we should maybe we should think yeah. about norman bates more as as a you know a suffering trans person who never got the help that he needed exactly I, i'd always considered him i've gone back and forth i've always considered him more of a multiple personality disorder and then one personality sort of took over another and that's how he ended up at the end but now that you say that he could potentially be a person with gender dysphoria that didn't get the care that he needed and that was the result you know yeah the like dysphoria is so intense that it drives the psyche to split yep and then you have this this mother altar um yeah it's it's, it's an interesting way to think about it it's definitely not it's not a way i've thought about it before too which is interesting well I, I think what we'll find in this exploration that lots of times the representation that we get whether it's you know, somebody like you and I that are just cis gay people or transgender or even non-binary type, non-binary people, it's not always the most flattering depiction because <laughs> outside of those two movies, I mean, I would even consider Norman Bates a great representation of transgender. I mean, they made him more crazy than anything. Um, you know, I, I guess the next thing, and some of the movies that I'll bring up aren't even really would probably wouldn't be considered horror they're more psychological thrillers but they kind of fit the pattern um cruising from 1980 with al pacino was the murder mystery that took place and i think it's uh hell's kitchen in new york city where he had to go undercover as a gay man wow. leather bars and things like that cruising with al pacino how have i never heard of this movie oh my god you've never heard you've got to go watch that you've got to go watch 1980. that 80 <laughs> yeah Oh my gosh, police detective goes undercover in the underground SM gay subculture of New York City to catch a serial killer who is preying on gay men. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is like everything I've wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I can't and Al Pacino does a really good job playing. He's a man that is obviously has some issues. He's obviously questioning his own sexuality. He gets sent on the assignment just because he fits the look of the victims he's the same makeup you know size that sort of thing is the victim he gets sent there because he fits the look and then he's obviously he's very cold to his wife so i think there's some questioning there and then he gets he has to play gay and he does a really good job of it <laughs> you know so a little a little too good at the acting gay kind of <laughs> No, you should go check that out. But that that is the Definitely. next. I am I am putting that on my list. We're gonna watch that tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, if you can find the unrated version, that it's 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 really good. And I don't know how accurate what it was uh, about the gay subculture in the 1980s in New York, but it, it's a great movie. And there was a lot of protests. Well, uh, a lot of gay certainly. advocacy groups protested, saying it was a terrible depiction of the gay lifestyle and. I can't speak to that. I didn't consider the lifestyle to be, I mean, to me, it's more of a representation of the S&M lifestyle rather than just being gay. So I can't speak to that, whether it was a good or bad representation, but it was a good I mean, movie. The S&M thing is a subculture. So mm -hmm. it's, it's different. I'd be interested. I mean, I've seen, I've, I've, you know, I've dipped my toe into that pond. 
once upon a time and I've, I've experienced the subculture and uh you know i'd be interested to compare then to 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 now because there's still there's a pretty there's a you know there's a pretty it's not a huge scene in new york and as far as s and um but there's there's like a regular they have a little event at a club called paddles every sunday night here which is normally a heterosexual S and M club slash hmm. bar, you know, like every day of the, you know, like six out of seven days of the week, <laughs> you know, Sunday nights it becomes the gay S and M party. Um, I love it. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Having managed gay bars for a, a great part of my twenties and thirties, I've seen quite a bit. But S and M is the one thing I haven't really haven't really seen. I managed uh, some. Uh, bear bars and i managed to stay show tunes quintessential gay bar uh so that and i managed to drag bar but that's the the uh, the height of my experience <laughs> well that's certainly you'll see some shit you yeah it's definitely yeah. definitely i saw some shit <laughs> i believe it i believe it for sure <laughs> But that's everywhere. I've seen shit in straight bars too. <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm really curious to see how they represented New York in the '80s because it was a different time. You know, it was a completely different time for homosexuals and for the city. So. It was uh, the way I always, uh, from what I've read and you know watched movies from that time period that were set in that were gay gay themed movies. It was a very freewheeling kind of lifestyle. There was this before AIDS, before yeah, before HIV and AIDS. It was kind of a freewheeling, be free, be yourself kind of time. It, it, kind of beautiful in a way, but you, you know, you could get yourself into s- some trouble if you made the wrong choices. And yeah, so I, I don't consider it a bad time. And I'm sure there was a lot of people that went hog wild. I mean, that's obvious. <laughs> totally. I mean, I missed it all. I was born in 82. So by the time I was conscious, you know, like all I knew was that gay people were like getting AIDS and it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I was the grade school and everything, you know, everything that was not good was gay. So I was like, okay, I don't want to be that, I guess. <laughs> That's me. I was born in 75. So I kind of missed that whole subculture, but you know, the seventies was kind of like that. I mean, I'm, I'm very definitely a Quaalude baby. I'll just leave it at that. But <laughs> Quaaludes were very popular in the 70s. And yes. I, most of my parents were were pretty high when they were pretty were rolling pretty good when I came in, you know, came into existence. But um and I've accepted that and moved on. <laughs> but uh yeah, but I, I remember the same as you, um, that AIDS was terrible and only gay people got it. And then, of course, when hemophiliacs started getting, they realized not just gay people, it's people in general. And then there was the whole fear and panic and uh, the fact that <clears throat> the fact that no money was really put into research until it was proven that it kind of was possible outside the gay community. That was a little disheartening. Yeah, Fauci doing the same thing he did then that he did with COVID, where he's like, oh, we don't know what to do. We just can't treat any of it. So we're just going to leave you here so you can die alone. Exactly. A lot of people don't realize that Fauci was the big purveyor of evil in the AIDS outbreak as well. Yep. It took forever for them to get the, you know, like the drugs that they were like, oh, these drugs are showing a little promise. And people were like, well, we should maybe let the people who are dying, you know, have access Mm -hmm. And they're exactly. like, oh, I don't know about that. It might not be a good idea. It might be bad. It's like they're dying. Like, what yeah. the worst? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And people want to bra- blame Reagan. And I'm sure Reagan had his part in it. But he was also probably misinformed by the medical community. So, yeah, you know, probably misinformed. Also, like, starting to go senile, you know. At that yeah, point, exactly. He was kind of like, ah. Okay. But- yeah, it's uh, it's and it's interesting how that the AIDS uh, epidemic sort of you know, impacted horror films like subsequently, mm-hmm. like down the line, and like the genre actually. Like, you know, we get a movie like uh, It Follows, mm-hmm. which is kind of sort of like you know, it's it's basically like a on the nose metaphor for an STD. Exactly, and just the whole '80s slasher phenomenon. The virgin survives. The final girl yes. or final guy is yes. a virgin. And so sex equals death equals right. AIDS equals whatever. 
Like anytime some characters are like, you know, if you know the character, you're watching a horror movie and characters are getting it on in the first 30 minutes, they're dead. Exactly. Sometimes <laughs> in the act. <laughs> right. It was like a rule. It was, you know, it was such a rule that Randy like had to enunciate it in the original Scream film. Exactly. And so, yeah, definitely. I think that all came out of the, the, the AIDS scare. I mean, there was never that much of a scare over any STD that I, that I ever have remember reading about or uh, seeing anything on. It was, it was AIDS for sure that kind of spurred that. And I don't know, I think the 80s is by far, okay, I'm going to get a lot of hate when I say this. 80s and 90s are my favorite genre, are my favorite decades for horror. Oh. And I do love the team, the teen hip, uh, scream esque uh, horror films. A lot of people say you're not a true horror film man, horror fan then. But uh, I love slasher. Slasher is absolutely my favorite genre, uh, other than Animal Attack, which that's a whole other thing I won't get into. But uh, the Animal Attack movies of the '70s, I have a huge affection for. But uh, slasher is absolutely my favorite. Uh, sub subcategory of horror i mean cujo was a really good film adaptation of the mm -hmm. story and jaws, jaws. Like, literally kept people out of the water for like years exactly <laughs> jaws yeah. was such a scary movie that it like impacted the economics of many small beach towns <laughs> exactly exactly like, pretty brutal and how how many rottweilers were returned or, or ended up in shelters out of after Cujo, right? You know, um, and then there's some lesser known ones. Uh, Willard and Ben are great movies, even though I am very heavily afraid of rats. Uh, those are good movies. And uh, Day of the Animals is another good one. If you want to see Leslie Nielsen fight a bear, that's your movie. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie Nielsen it does not get enough play now. He's no, he doesn't. He was definitely like an icon in the 80s and 90s. And unless you sort of like live through it, like, or you're watching something that where he's featured, like in a retrospective, mm -hmm. like you miss it. Exactly. And some people all they only associate him with the naked gun and airplane. Yeah. And yes, he was phenomenal in both of those. But if you Leslie Nielsen played some villains in his time. In the Day of the Animals, he's the one of the villains. He plays some mean son bitches. Uh, <laughs> he's a lot more than a comedic actor. He really is. Yeah, he's um, good. <clears throat> um, probably in the 80s, the most gay movie I remember in the 80s is uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. Freddy oh, yeah. Part. Super gay. Quintessential gay. Even though it wasn't, he wasn't gay in the film, it was all gay. Every bit of it. Even Freddie was gay in that film. I mean, it was just my uh, my my boyfriend and I, Daniel, and I were watching that movie, and we were like, "This is really gay." And we like after we watched it, we like started to dig into it on the internet, and like it was all sort of intentional. Like the 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 lead male actor, or whatever, or was was like gay. Or maybe, am I thinking of the third one? Or am I getting, no, I think it's- No, this. no, it, it, he, he is gay. They did a whole documentary on him called uh, Scream King or Scream, some, right. some of that. Yeah. Yeah, we, we watched that. I remember we, we saw that and we were talking about it. But yeah, that's, it's so gay. And it's so bad too. <laughs> like, oh, it's bad. It's campy, but it's one of my favorites just because I know how campy it is. And it's awesome. Like you had the whole s &M reference with the coach. You had- yes. Uh, Freddie was kind of equaling wanting to come out of the closet. You had him obviously being in love with his best friend, and then the girl hopelessly in love with him, but him trying to love her. I mean, it had everything that a closeted young gay man in the 80s would need. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it was good. I mean, it was it was just so on the nose, but also it was kind of still in, it was like subtext. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of interesting because the you know, the the idea of being stalked by like a supernatural killer. You know, it's it it does sort of ring. You know, that's how it feels to the young gay individual as they're sort of like re like realizing, oh shit, you know, I'm attracted to my, the same sex. Like that's mm -hmm. fuck. <laughs> like, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Like oh, like it is kind of like being you know like oh, I got to deal with this like supernatural thing that's gonna stalk me for the rest of my life. <laughs> exactly. That's how you know. I think that's how we all feel growing up. You know, but I think. 
and I'm probably gonna get hate for saying this, but I think it's easier for us lesbians than it is for you, for you guys in a way, because girls are almost raised to be bisexual in a way. I mean, it's okay for us to hold hands with our girlfriends. It's okay for us to kiss our girlfriends and show affection to our girlfriends. But men, it's, it's a kind of a different standard. And I think society always is more understanding of lesbians than they are gay men. And I think it's unfortunate. You know, I think Western culture has for a long time had a very unhealthy um, relationship with male, like platonic male love and platonic mm -hmm. male bonding, uh, just expressing affection platonically between men. And I don't know if it's like always been like that, but like, it just, it seems like it, it's, I mean, it was a problem for me growing up. And, you know, my dad was always, he's very sort of like hands off, not very super affectionate uh, guy. And also like my friends growing up, same kind of way. Um, so I feel like there's probably this, it's like we have this stigma Well, that's like, you know, but hopefully now you would think that that's gone. Now we have the exact opposite problem. The straight people, you know, they want to be <laughs> seen as members of, you know, the hangers on community. Yeah. Uh, with all their neo pronouns and you know made up gender identities and such but like i don't know why we just can't have everybody just be accepted for who they are and not have you know like it doesn't have like yes gay people are a minority that's fine like you don't have to be you know they them or whatever mm -hmm. but then again like the whole thing with the kids too is that this reminds me of you know i, I guess you were like a, a little older than me but when i was a kid there were like goths ravers yeah uh preppy kids jocks skaters yeah so, and like band kids you know mm -hmm. so like everybody had their little niche and i think feel like now that it's more like they have you know this there's like their mm -hmm. you know there's like the blm folks and there's like the, the the trans you know queer you know people and everybody is sort of slotting themselves in because it's really important for kids to feel like they belong to a, a group or a tribe mm -hmm. um and, and yeah, it's just, it just seems like it's gotten to this unhealthy place where they can't just sort of like naturally be it. They, it's like we, now that the teachers have to affirm it, it's just totally cuckoo bananas. I, I agree. I agree. You know, I, I do occasionally wander on the TikTok to see what's going on. And there's like so many of these pronouns, I have no idea. And if you think, I don't ever want to be intentionally an asshole to people. And if you ask me to call you something, I'll call you that. I'm not a jerk. Within but in my head, you're not really clown and clown self. And that's a, actually a pronoun. And I'm like, I'm not calling. No. Yeah, you're a clown, <laughs> but not the way you think. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, I have a TikTok too. I, I occasionally make TikTok videos. I tend to try to keep, keep like little short snips um, about something topical, trending. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, I, I just try to put, you know, my voice out there as like a reasonable, moderate gay man. Mm -hmm. Because I just feel like we need more of our people being like, yeah. we're not all crazy, I swear. No, no we're, we're, we're not. And you know, speaking for the big four of the LGBT plus community, when it used to be just LGBT, that is lesbian, bi, trans, gay, we look at the rest of these Johnny and Joanna come lately. It's like, what the fuck? Not everybody can be on our softball team. Get the fuck off, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Find something else. Like, gender bending is our thing. Like, stop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, Harry Styles. Like, why? Seriously? Come on. Yeah. Like. You have to have that too. Like you can't, like, and I get it. Like, I, it's cute that he has people come out at his show and he's facilitating that. But like, mm -hmm. does he need to be like a they them? Does he need to like, you know, dress, uh, you know, feminine? Does he need to bend the gender? Like, it's. I feel yeah. like it's just also market marketing. You know, it's very. It's it's commercial. trendy. It's trendy. It's not like when uh, Eddie Izzard. I mean, you go do it when Eddie Izzard yes. did it. And tell me how tough you are. I mean, it's it, it it's some kind of it's a social trend, and um, I think I'll, hopefully a lot of them will grow out of it as they get older. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, not put on you know blockers and cross sex hormones. Oh Ooh. God, don't even get me started about <laughs> grooming and transitioning of young children. I mean, <laughs> hey, if well, my son or daughter my came to project me, project crusades. Yeah, 
if my son or daughter came to me and said, mom, I think um, whatever the opposite sex may be, okay, but let's go talk to somebody. I would take them to not a gender affirming counselor, but a counselor <laughs> and let's talk through this. And if when you're 18, you still feel this way, I will support you in any way you want to transition. But no, not cutting off your PP at age 12. I'm sorry. Oh, poor Jazz Jennings. Anyway, we've digressed. <laughs> anyway, speaking of uh, transitioning young children, uh, Sleepaway Camp. Are you familiar with that? No. Is that another film? That is a that is a horror film. Um, I actually am friends with the star of that film, of uh, 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 Rose Esposito, uh, Felicia Rose Esposito. Uh, basically, what you have is a it's, it's a rip off of uh, Friday the Thirteenth for sure. It's a camp there being there's it's a slasher. Uh, there's it starts with a gay man and his two children uh, on a boating trip, and there's an accident and. Only one of the twins survives. That's a boy and a girl twin, fraternal twins. And then fast forward to 10 years later, um, you have what seems to be the female twin is living now with her aunt, who's just cuckoo kachu, just straight up crazy. Uh, it, this is the only way to describe her. And her son, who's also the cousin. And they go to this camp, and then these people start getting killed. And then the end is like one of the most well known you know, one of the most bizarre endings ever to be a horror film but essentially what happened it was actually the boy twin that survived and the crazy aunt because she wanted a daughter not another son raised her raised him as a girl and then he just snaps and starts <laughs> starts killing people <laughs> it's like a it's like a dark version of like the rhymer twin story it is it's exactly that it, it's exactly it would surprise me if it wasn't based on that I've actually done a video on John Money and that experiment, and that was just horrific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's some some dark history for sure. Yeah, it's funny. But, uh, that's the guy that coined the term gender affirming care. Like, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on the list too. Sleep with a cat. 1983, right? 1983. Yeah, I haven't heard of that one either. But that's another one. Tell me what you think after you see it, because that's another one. Okay. Because he was forcibly transitioned, I don't really consider him trans either. I think he was just abused and probably had PTSD and snapped. Right. So. That makes sense. And then cruising is this other one. And then, of course, we get into the 90s and you started having more, uh, I think, more gay, uh, lesbian, trans characters that were just that were side characters, you know, normal everyday characters in, in movies. You know, you had that with, uh, was it Scream? Well, Scream didn't really have openly gay characters until I think it was Scream 3 and Scream 4. So but, like, can we talk for a minute about the first Scream movie? Because oh, uh, I, oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Mr. Mikey Harlow can give his official opinion on that one. But I always sort of thought that the two killers had a thing. Oh, they were so gay. Yeah, right like, <laughs> they were so gay the top and bottom energy there was just so evident like especially in that last scene where they're like stabbing each other i'm like ah and, and scary movie the waynans brothers they played the, the hell right. up out of that right. yes <laughs> totally totally <laughs> that was yeah definitely some homoerotic energy going on there yeah i definitely and i also enjoyed the um the parody the uh, scary movies Those oh yeah too Oh, I love the Wayne's Brothers. <laughs> I was a huge In Living Color fan. When they started doing movies, I was like, yes. Yes, Mad TV, In Living Color. That that whole, like, this generation really doesn't know what they missed. Like, we really, I feel like we really lived through, like, the peak of, like, you know. Television. Television. <laughs> that, uh, I was a huge fan of Kids in the Hall, uh, The State. Of course, the people from The State then went on to do Reno 911, which I was always also a fan of. So good. Uh, of course, SN SNL to me has not been funny in the last since, right. Will, since Will Ferrell and uh, Amy Poehler and all of them left. To me, it just like the last time funny. SNL was funny was like 1994. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like uh, when they were doing like Bill Clinton impressions, like they were good. Like, 
But ever, you know, like what, anything after the turn of the millennium, I'm just like, no, 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 no. Um, in the 90s, you also had, or actually 1990 officially, um, Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill. Again, another, was he trans or was he a, just a psycho cross-dresser? You know, again, that ambiguity. But there was, you know, there was that gender bending. There was that ambiguity. There was that playfulness. And there was that inclusion. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, he is the bad guy. And yes, he's like, you know, murdering women and like, you know, wearing their skin. But like, it's, it's, it's there. And, you know, it's... It's it shouldn't be neglected, and then that's the other thing. Like I never would think of that as like a gay sort of nod or like a trans nod, but it is. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most infamous. It's on my collage back here. It's one of the most infamous uh, get killers in all of horror and all of cinema. And he could could be trans, could be cross, definitely gay, because Hannibal Lecter talked about him having sexual affairs with some of his other male male patients definitely right. gay definitely gay. definitely gay so very well written character in my opinion and Lecter too i think he didn't he flirt with dudes at one point oh yeah Please? oh yeah, yeah. Lecter bi also. bisexual right. you know but it's uh, definitely at least i mean anthony anthony hopkins is just uh. he's like prince you know he he could he could be as effeminate but also take your woman or your man from you <laughs> Yes, yeah. so he's like, a master, master of the craft. Like, uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins, definitely up there. One of my favorite actors of all time. I really like uh, him. Sean Connery, I think, is probably one of my top favorites. I like Sean. I do like Sean. I like Patrick Stewart too. Uh, Stewart, yeah. Although Patrick Stewart, he got a little woke in his old age. Yeah, I, but, I know. Whatever. I can't blame him. <laughs> no, I mean. Uh, you know, uh, Sean Connery, with all his allegations of him abusing his wives and stuff, you know, he probably wasn't the best person, but I try to separate, I have to separate art from the person, or, or you'll never enjoy any art right, ever exactly. in your life. You have to accept that just because somebody isn't a perfect ideal of a person, that they can do good things, or they can produce work that is of a high quality. Exactly, exactly. So it's just the nature of, you know, every, it's, everybody has their pluses and minuses. Everybody has their high moments and low moments. And, and, you know, people also in the past were locked in a different time. And if you're, especially when you're talking about Sean Connery and his views toward women, like he's largely a product of the century. Like it's mm -hmm. just, it's sad to say, but like, this is how men treated women, like for most of the 20th century. Across <laughs> Look at the Bond films. I mean, that's a yes, prime exactly. example. Women were possessions. They were trophies. They were, and we ate it up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but honestly, you honestly ask, ask any woman of my generation or older, of Gen X, you know, early millennials like yourself, uh, Gen X or baby boomers, they're going to say that the Bond movies were sexy as hell. Because Margaret Atwood, you know, uh, uh, what is it, the... Uh, Handmaiden's Tale. She actually had a book of short stories uh, that I read in college. And in one of those was a story called Rape Fantasies. And it was just this com comedic take on how all women have a fantasy of some lover breaking through and just vandalizing them. But it, she did it in a very comedic way. It was almost like an SNL skit, the, okay. skit, the way this went down. And she was hitting on something. She was hitting on something. Yeah, it's interesting. The, uh, the, the culture and the conversations around, you know, sex and especially womenhood and femininity. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we don't even have like, it's like what it, like we, we had this whole, we're having this whole cultural moment now about like, what is a woman? Like it's, it's totally changed because a woman used to be, you know, the feminine sort of matriarchal representative in the family. And then in the 20th and into the 21st century, we got this idea that she is completely equivalent in every single way to the male counterpart. And so she can, you know, be every, every single way the male counterpart, which is true. Like, you know, you, a, a, a woman can in, 
fulfill all the same functions as a man in a lot of you know our societal jobs and, and roles and stuff like that. But like we've sort of lost the the thing that makes us special and unique and distinct, mm -hmm. and that kind of is coming out now in our film and our arts and our culture. Exactly, there are differences between men and women. I mean, and between gay and straight people, and and trans people and cis people. There are differences, and it's okay. It's okay. I mean, women are naturally, for example, women are naturally biologically weaker than men. Um, I'm sorry, you know, feminists come, second and third wave feminists come at me, but but we are, you know, and when it comes to like G.I. Jane, that was like hot when I was in college. Okay, great. And it was a great movie and I loved Demi Moore, but that's unrealistic. There's never been a female seal to my knowledge because they just can't meet the standards but without lowering the standards. And what does that do? It puts our defense, you know, our country in jeopardy if we start lowering standards. If a woman can meet standards on the already established standards, go for it. Absolutely. You know, but there are differences. There are certain things that men are more inclined to do than women. Women tend to be nurturers. They're more into people and culture and things like that, where men like things. Men like logic. Not that a woman can't be logical either, too, but women tend to gravitate toward being mothers, nurses, lawyers, but even sometimes when they're attorneys, they go toward like a certain type of law where a man might go to corporate law. We all have, an, we have inherent differences and it's okay. Yeah. And that's the, the nice thing about diversity and we can have all of these things and we can appreciate them. And we don't have to have such rigid ideas about, you know, like, like that trans women have to be women. Like, it's just like, why are you, why are you so, why are you like, and the thing about that that really grinds my gears is that it erases women, but it also erases trans women who have like a very unique, distinct experience. And it, absolutely. They, you know. Absolutely. And it, it, it also, I think that most, I have most of the trans people I know, whether trans men or, and I have dated both a trans man and a trans woman. So I have a unique, um, unique perspective on that. They just want to fit in. They believe in the gender binary. They believe there's only two biological sexes, only two biological genders, you know, however you want to term that. And they're just trying to fit in and blend in and live their lives. And um, at least the, most of the ones I, I have known, that's how they feel. And they are not under any delusion that they would if they dug up their corpse in a hundred years, that they wouldn't be tagged as the opposite of what they want to be. Totally. Um, but, I guess that brings us up to, are we still in the eighties? Are there any other 80s? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's I okay. get off on these tangents. No, these are great. These are great tangents. Um, so we're up to uh, the nineties and of course with the uh, silence of the lambs. And then of course you have all the Screams, the I Know What You Did Last Summers, um, The Faculty, those types of movies. I don't remember any outwardly gay characters in any of those. So. No. no, The Faculty is actually still one of my favorites. I, I love The Faculty. I like Jon Stewart. You know, he just shows up there randomly, mm -hmm. um, which is fun. And I liked the, the cast. I thought the kids did an amazing job. They had really mm -hmm. good chemistry on screen. Um, the effects were great for the time period and the twist at the end was good. Like it's, you know, you don't really see it coming. Like at least I didn't the first time I saw it. You know, it makes sense in retrospect, but that's like every horror movie. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, very good. Like, movie. It does. And it also sort of follows like the horror, uh, you know, film, like the, the recipe almost like in the same way as like, it's, it's almost like a whodunit. Like you're kind of like following this group of kids and it's like, all right, which one's the killer? Exactly. Exactly. It's kind of like Clue, but on, on a, uh, all jacked up on steroids. And the fact that it was, not only were they like basically based off Invasion of the Body Snatchers, it was uh, very heavily related to that source material. They referenced it. It was meta, just like everything in the 90s was meta. They were talking about Invasion of the Body Snatchers the whole time. So I, I find that just, that find that whole premise interesting. Yeah, it's a really, and it's also a very scary uh, metaphor for ideological possession, you know, like what mm -hmm. kind of what happens in a way when 
somebody gets so caught up in an ideological system, you know, a philosophical movement, you know, like we could look at, you know, like Maoism in China or, you know, uh, Nazism in Germany and how large swaths of people get sort of possessed by this alien intelligence, which mm -hmm. causes them to behave, you know, in violent, you know, ways towards other people. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, mm -hmm. and like, how did, how did Stalin convince the Russian people that it was okay to enforce collectivism in such a way that they were not only taking possessions from the middle class, but executing the middle class to the tune of about 60 million people and convince them that was okay and even have them support it. How does one get to that point? How, how do you do that? I mean, yeah, and we're, we're talking like, you know, between Russia and China, it, it's like anywhere between like, like 90 and like 150 million people. Like, mm -hmm. we didn't even know, like, that's the, the other thing is that the records were so bad. They just mm -hmm. killed so many people. It's like the, the estimates are just so wide ranging because like, we're not sure how many people they actually, you know, ended up offing. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, the, how did Hitler con convince all the people it was okay to murder six million Jews? And it just makes you wonder how people get to that. And that's the faculty was an interesting study on that, um, as well as um, disturbing behavior. Another very interesting from that from that era. Yes. Uh, similar, similar time period. Uh, I think they were with, within a year of each other. Mm -hmm, definitely. And, both have that sort of like, um, you know, wanting to belong, fit in. Disturbing behavior was the one where they like move to a small town and it follows the brother and his family. And he's got like a younger sister. And then he sort of befriends like the outcast kids at school. And then like very soon it becomes clear that something's not quite right with the preppy kids. Yep. And then there's this like sick psychiatrist doctor who's been putting like implants in them to make them perfect like little stepford kids and then when they do anything wrong they literally lose it the the chip short circuits and they start becoming violent and it, it's actually a very interesting sociological study yeah and then i think too it was like uh whenever they got like sexually aroused was like mm -hmm. one of the triggers yeah absolutely was... anytime they did anything that a normal teenager would do right <laughs> yeah that, that anything was but study yeah, the idea of having your willpower hijacked and displaced and becoming sort of an automaton, it's its a recurring theme in a lot of our horror and even our TV. I mean, the Borg in Star Trek, same mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even like the uh, the face huggers and aliens, the idea of, you know, something getting a hold of you, putting something inside of you, and then a monster bursting forth and killing the previous version of yourself. Mm -hmm. It could also, you know, apply to ideological possession or being, you know, like taken over into one of these cult, these ideas, these cults of idea type organizations like the Antifas or the, uh, you know, even a, a right wing group. It doesn't really matter. It could be a right or a left, any sort of, you know, or it could even be like a criminal gang. Like, you mm -hmm. know, a young 13, 14 young guy gets mm -hmm. caught up in a gang and the sweet young person that he was, you know, is basically destroyed by a monster that gets planted into his chest by, you know, not friendly things in the environment. <laughs> Peer pressure is a hell of a, a hell of a motivator. It's a hell of a way to get sucked into something. Humans have this un unparalleled desire to be to belong to something and to be accepted and sometimes when you find those people it's the wrong type of people for you to be accepted by so yeah yeah they're not 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 good people looking out for the best you know possible outcome for you <laughs> exactly exactly and i don't recall any just outlandish um any just obvious i think this is where we start to see gay people appearing as side characters, you know, um, that are just normal, uh, as we are, just normal people. <laughs> Buffy and Willow, I think, was a big moment for me. Like, Definitely. I was very excited when Willow came out. Although I, was little, I know. I had, a, I had a crush on her. I was like, oh, I'll never I have. I think everybody did. <laughs> how could you not i mean she was this like little magical redhead like she was adorable she's a great character allison hannigan yeah. 
I love Allison Hannigan. I think she still hosts a uh, Penn and Teller show. And uh, she was hosting their uh, Fool Me show on television. And then I think she also hosts their show in Las Vegas, too. She did. She was also in uh, that mother show, like Have You Met My Mom or something. Yeah. Yeah. Which I never really, I never really watched, but like, I just, I noticed, I was like, Allison Hannigan. I never really got into that. <laughs> I, I never really got into How I Met Your Mother. Um, I was more of a, it's more of a Sex in the City uh, office fan during that time period. <laughs> Oh geez, TV is so much fun. Yeah, I've uh, is great. rewatching. I've rewatched the Buffy series at least once, possibly twice, in my adult life. <laughs> I, I I'm sure I've rewatched it at least three times. I mean, well, given <laughs> what's you know available now in the market, I would totally advise young people if you are frustrated with what you're watching on Hulu or you don't know what to watch, go re go watch you know for the first time Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the original Joss Whedon series from the '90s, because it's seven seasons of wonderful. And uh, mm -hmm. another good one is the original Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh, I have watched Star Trek, rewatched Star Trek twice. The first, and... I feel like the first two seasons could be a little campy. Yeah. Um, but you know, it really finds its legs in the third season. That's a big cliffhanger when they finally introduce the Borg, mm -hmm. um, and Captain Picard gets assimilated. It's like <sighs> my only beef with that show is how they killed off uh, uh, Lieutenant Yar. Oh, she, was, I, she had to leave. She was. I know she. I know she had to leave, but just to have <laughs> her killed by a, a tar monster. Come on. Yeah. Well, that was again. That was early, right? So that was kind yeah. of sort of before the show really found its <laughs> legs. They were like they were trying to like be this new thing, but also they were, you know, they were really based off of the old '60s series. Mm -hmm. So they hadn't quite really like found the way to really become their own thing yet. So that, that one really feels like, you know, like a Captain Kirk kind of episode. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, I love Next Generation. I didn't really get into Deep Space Nine or any of the other. Uh, I'm not even really into original Star Trek. It was just the Next Generation for me. I never watched, I never watched the original either. <laughs> My still, dad watched it, but I just I couldn't get into it. Yeah, no, I, I liked the TNG and I liked the uh, the Voyager and the DS9. They were good too, um, especially some of the some of the side characters in those movies. Like it just became very clear to me that like some of them were like obvious nods to like gay people, which mm -hmm. were great. And then it wasn't until you know more recently they had like more like obvious gay characters. Like if you have, I don't know if you've seen the Orville. Yes, I love the Orville. Oh, I love the Orville. The Orville, I feel like, has inherited the mantle of Star Trek. It's like it has today. It is what Star Trek: The Next Generation was in the '90s, and what the original Star Trek, you know, was. And, it, so, and to be done by a true fan. I mean, Seth MacFarlane is an obvious fan of the Next Generation, and he does it so. And the fact they brought Dolly Parton into it more than once. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I mean, I can't believe they have like not one, not two, but three episodes dealing with like detransitioning, like as a yeah. like, shoe. Like it's just so like really on the cutting edge of like where the culture is mm -hmm. and being culturally relevant. It became, you know, I, I thought when I first started, oh, this is just going to be like another Family Guy. It's going to be a parody, and it is in a lot of ways. It's funny. It's funny. It's very, it's very much Family Guy type of humor, but it's also a really good science fiction show. Yeah, the third season, I really, like, found myself, like, chain-watching the episodes, like, watching one, and then, like, I really wanted to know what happened next, like, yeah, it gets really good, and it gets, it's, it gets really good really fast, so I, I, I really enjoy that one. Exactly, um, but when it comes to sci-fi in the 80s, um, I was a Battlestar Galactica fan, I was the first one. Uh, Battlestar Galactica 1980 was horrible. I, I love the reruns of the original Battlestar Galactica. And it's not very well known, but there was two miniseries and a short-run TV series called V. I, the original and then V, uh, the final battle, and then there was a television series. I love those. Those were one of the first major appearances of, uh, of Freddy Krueger, of Robert Englund. He played uh, uh, one of the aliens that was on our side. And he did a phenomenal job. Nice. You know, I, I remember finding V when I was like a teenager. And it was like, you know, in the back of a West Coast video. Yeah. And it came in like a double. It was like two tapes. 
Mm -hmm. um and it was just like the it was like the first like one where like they came and it was like uh you know and it turns out that there are these lizard people that are trying to eat you know like people to, and like take, take all the water and eat us <laughs> yeah it's like this is amazing i was like it was, and then it was funny because you know years later uh are you familiar with david ike have you heard of david ike mm -hmm. Yeah, so like he's like, like he does the like the shape shifting lizard people as like you know his theory. So it, yeah, I was just like, oh, he's just like somebody who saw V and got like a little too excited. About the v, idea. if you actually watch the premise, it's kind of what we were talking about with Stalin, Mao, Hitler. Mm -hmm. It's almost how somebody can come in as a sheep that's really a wolf in sheep's clothing and yeah. take advantage, and then. Uh, set themselves up as one thing and then start slowly eliminating anybody that disagrees. It could be any author authoritarian government around the world, you know. They, they were our friends and everybody had to accept them. And then the scientists that were starting to doubt who they were and what their intentions were started getting murdered, disappearing, right. getting arrested. And then they took control of media so that you couldn't find out the truth. It's very scary. Yeah, and it does it does very much parallel sort of a communist uh, takeover. And, you know, that kind of plays into the themes that were very heavy in the 80s at the time, you know, with the Soviet unions appearingly, you know, on the ascendancy, you know, of course, mm -hmm. it collapsed in, in, you know, the early 90s, but, you know, they didn't, we didn't, the people at the time didn't know that was coming. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's very similar. And also it shows, you know, the, one of the things was that there was the collaborators, the people that were also ready to just jump on the alien bandwagon and, you know, be like friends with the aliens. Like let's, and it just reminds yeah. me of people like jumping on the woke bandwagon or, you know, whatever the, the, the issue du jour is, you know, it's like yesterday it was Ukraine yeah. you know, tomorrow. It'll be like, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm waiting. That. Actually, I expect them fully to fake an alien invasion. So <laughs> I saw V. You'll see me spray paint V all over the place. <laughs> yes. We will educate the children one way or another. You know, after Biden's whole red and black speech, you know, <laughs> some of the images from V are even more frightening because there was a lot of red and in that too <laughs> you know i think that was intentional i like really think they're like doing this like last desperate push to make him appear you know strong and scary because strong and scary is better than like pooping your pants and not able to walk the right way off stage yeah, yeah but then there's the wrong type of scary <laughs> and they nailed that <laughs> right exactly and it's just like what are you guys doing like it's just uh i don't know we had uh i had this uh, another documentarian filmmaker on the show uh the last episode and his he was basically like this is just like a caa psyop thing to try to make him look you know scary and strong because they're they're flailing like they're they're just flailing like he's the the most not strong president we've had in a long time i mean like the whole pooping his pants thing at the vatican was pretty well known so <laughs> did that really happen or was that just a rumor no that, it really that, happened it, that i mean nobody like has video or pictures but like the timing was right and and the uh the need for him to change was confirmed so it was just a little like like why why you need a new suit mr president what happened <laughs> As somebody who is IBS, I can totally empathize with that. But still, it's not the image you want the president to bring. No, it, <laughs> this is really the like. I mean, frankly, why we have anybody over the age of sixty-five in that office? It's it's criminal. It's cruel. First of all, it's not good for the country because right. you know, you're in your you're in your sunshine years. You're you know your your sunset. You years. should be enjoying your life. You know, you, you, you really should. And I'm going to sound like an ageist. I don't mean it that way, but you need somebody with fresh ideas that's young and has the perception of being stronger. And, you know, I have no problem with anybody ages, age 50 to 65 having that office. But once you get up in 70, 80, too much. And it, in any of it, like, you know, Nancy Pelosi in Congress in her 80s, like, what's the other one? Maxine Waters, Waters. on 78. Uh, there, uh, the, the senators that, one of the senators that was in, well, up until just two two years ago, one of the senators that was uh, one of, a senator from Alabama, where I'm from, was still in power. Uh, and he was in office when I was in elementary school. There's oh my God. absolutely no reason for that. We should have term limits. The president has term limits. Why not Congress? 
or just like you know step out and let somebody else you know have have a turn like i don't know like why we have to have term limits like i don't just don't understand why these guys can't just graciously retire when they reach you know the age of retirement and and it's just because they're probably because they have personality disorders and they they have pathological need to hold on to power power it's a power grab and also they get rich in public service the founders of our country they made their money other ways at least as far as we know they were scientists they were doctors they were uh, merchants they were farmers they made their money else being a public servant was a part-time gig that's what it was supposed to be and it's supposed to be a service it's supposed to be like an act of like you know you're you're sacrificing your time mm-hmm. energy you know to do the right thing and like these these people have turned it into this like ridiculous derivative job where they just show up and collect a paycheck and you know anybody who points that out like marjorie taylor green or thomas massey uh, they just, you know, they 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 call them all sorts of names, and they use every opportunity in the media to to bash them, and so you know, they don't want anybody to to emulate them. Well, local government in small towns is the best example of what government should be. Mm-hmm. You have a mayor that is part time. Sometimes you might have a full time mayor, but you have a mayor that's part time. They make a very small salary. You most of your town councils and city councils are very small and part time. They make maybe. $10,000 a year doing what they do. So they have to make, you know, their money elsewhere. And it's right. a service. Yes. It's a service. That's how it should be. But again, we've digressed. So, ah, sorry. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So it's now fine. we're up to the 2000s. And I'll just say 2000s through present. Um, this is where we actually start seeing not only major characters that are uh, LGBT, but also LGBT specific heart as well. Um, the first one I remember, uh, and I don't think it was supposed to be, but the the coven, it was kind of the male equivalent of the craft. Oh, that came off as very gay. Uh, was it the coven or was it the? Am I thinking of the covenant? It's the, the coven. There is a one called the covenant, but it's I believe it was the coven. Oh Jesus, I'm so confused now. Hold on, the coven. It was uh, 2006. Yeah, it was basically a uh, the male equivalent of the craft. But they, I think, because they were trying to appeal to tweens, they made these characters so in touch with their feminine side. Not that there's anything wrong with a man being in touch with his feminine side, but they came off as really gay, like Stu and uh, like Scream Killers, gay. Oh, is it the one with the guy who plays James Holden? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that's the Covenant, two thousand six. Yeah, Covenant. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, no, that was pretty gay. I remember that. Those boys were hot. They were all hot. Yeah, <laughs> just like the craft. I can appreciate that. They were all. Yeah, hot. they were the. So that's the one where they're like male witches, and mm-hmm. they have like a power that comes to you. Ooh, go away. That comes to them when they're eighteen, and then like the more they use it, it ages them rapidly or something. Yep, and they become more and more evil the more that they use like the darker side of the magic. And yes. then, of course, Interview with the Vampire, I think that was more 1990s, but that was also kind of gay. Well, yeah, it was a little, it was like gay mystique. There were, there definitely was a sort of underlying romantic tension between Lestat that and Louis. Yeah, and Louis. Um, yeah, you know, like, and you don't really think of that as like a gay film or like gay cinema. You don't even think of them as gay characters, which is kind of really why it, it works so well. Mm-hmm. And that film really holds the test of time. It does. And it's it's because it's when you it's when you try to have it be so overt and in your face, it almost like the writing takes a hit, like the mm-hmm. quality. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, it's like all of a sudden now you're in this like subgenre of like gay film, and you don't want to be there. You know, you want to be able to have characters that are gay or queer. And have your film be, you know, appeal to everyone, you know, and just, so that's the cool thing about it, which, you know, like, even though there isn't, you know, really a heterosexual romance in in the film, people can still identify with like the toxic nature of the relationship between, you know, Louis and Lestat. Exactly. And I think that is the best way. Just make a good film with no, with no politics and people can be ambiguous you know, and it's okay, 
you know, to me, that person might be gay. To a straight person, that person might be straight. And that's what's so beautiful about it, you know? Yeah, because the film sort of lets you be you, like it, it's you are the the sort of mirror upon which the film is reflecting. So mm -hmm. you can vibe with any aspect of it. Great. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then we get into the, of course, the era of um, oh, goodness, uh, what I like to call torture porn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I started with Saw. I saw, and I, I I enjoyed the first two, but after that, I just I couldn't I couldn't anymore. The genre doesn't do it for me. I'm not really a big fan. Like gore was always like, for me, it, it if it made sense and it you know, it exacerbated or like in in like John Carpenter's The Thing, like the yeah. gore in that movie is just so on point. It's just enough. You know, mm -hmm. it, it pushes your, your comfort, like it makes you feel like really grossed out. Um, but it's not like they're just showing you gore for gore's sake. Like there's this mm -hmm. whole context of this creature and it's causing mutations. And um, whereas like Saw and like Hostel and a lot of the other like torture porn, it's just mm -hmm. like for the sake of gore. It's like, yeah. we're just going to show you these people getting like, you know, literally taken apart. Or mm -hmm. in the case of, you know, what was that movie? A uh, human centipede taken apart. Oh, yeah. I, I I made it through the first one of those. I didn't see any good. I, I was I nauseous. I refuse. I refuse. I won't. I won't watch it. I was nauseous. It, it's like, a, it reminds me of the old movie Blood Feast from, I believe it was in the 1970s. It was just gore for gore's sake, but it was so obviously fake that it's campy and funny. I could get into that. And uh, the only other movie I'd say that it's just grotesquely all awful in depictions of violence but to me it, it fit was i spit on your grave um the original one yeah but the horror from that movie comes from the 30 minutes of sexual assault footage that you have to sit through i mean it was just horror for there's no soundtrack there's no music so the horror comes from literally what you're seeing on camera and yeah. it's 30 minutes of you just watching this poor woman being tor and then she gets her revenge and it's you know you, you cheer for her right but it's called i spit on your grave spit on your grave uh, there's a re there's a couple of remakes but the original from 70 i want to say it's 78 is the best i spit on your grave 1978 yep yep you know that one i missed that one i missed a lot of the films that came out in the uh the late 70s early 80s because i was you know they talk about a lot of deep subjects. Like, that's part of a, a genre of horror called exploitation horror, and the horror comes from just showing the worst of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that one, and then uh, when there's one called a Serbian film, you don't want to see that one either. That one, it's like you'll make you. It it, it made me physically sick. You don't you don't want to see that one. But um, brutal. Yeah, yeah. But. Um, when you get into the 2000s, I mean, outside of some, you know, just cliche gay characters in the background of certain movies, I don't, until you get to like the actual gay horror films, uh, like the, the, the new one on Peacock, They, Them, uh, I think this is where we start seeing, how should I say, inclusion for inclusion's sake. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's just like the so, it's so overt. Yeah, that you can't, you know, you can't ignore it. It's not, it's, oh, it's, it's text. It's not subtext anymore. Exactly. And I appreciate the movies where you didn't know, where they were all ambiguous and you can make of it what you want to make of it. Yeah. Well, I, I think, feel like that has a little bit more, it's, it's more wiggle room and also it's got wider appeal. Mm -hmm. and, and you would think that because of that, it would be more popular. But now there's this there's this weird mismatch between what filmmakers think uh, audiences want and what actual audiences want. I just want to be entertained, right? That's, I mean, that's like ninety percent of the audience. Just you it doesn't know. have to be a message. I just want to be entertained, and, and horror has, has always been the genre that's just entertainment for entertainment's sake. There's never really been messaging in horror, it, you know. I see a lot of people saying, well, they make gay people look stupid. They make black people look stupid. You know, 
insert any group, they make you look stupid. I'm like, because horror makes everyone look stupid. No one ever died in a horror film from making the right decision. Right? Exactly. You know, we're all stupid. And like, again, that's, you know, welcome to the club. Welcome to inclusion. Like, well, welcome to equality. <laughs> welcome to equality. Yes. You get to be stupid and you get to be murdered just like everybody else on film. Like, and you, and you get to be a murderer with absolutely no motive or a murderer with a very good motive, but you get to be a murderer. And I would love to see them do a well-written horror film, much like Silence of the Lambs that has a gay killer, I, a lesbian killer. I don't think we've seen a lesbian killer yet. Somebody write me a movie with a damn good lesbian killer totally yeah we haven't we haven't seen that yet and i can't i don't think there's ever been well, basic instinct maybe but she uh, was just messed up i don't think she was she was yeah she was like that was like sort of almost a uh like a reactionary film towards the feminism of like 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 what she was sort of like how men in power perceived you know, strong women in power in like the nineties, like coming yeah. up through like the corporate ranks. Like they yeah, she was just, yeah kind of like a, a feminazi <laughs> archetype. Yeah, it's like this vicious, like psychopathic, like will manipulate you and get you and you, you know, you're you're totally and she'll and then she'll play the victim. It was oh, such a good movie. It was a good movie. And oh, I love Michael Douglas. I went see where she does the thing with her legs where she's Yeah. <laughs> and the two cops are just like <laughs> that was the first time i think i saw a vagina on film really you never yeah. saw carrie um you know i don't think I, I didn't see that until after i saw basic instinct okay okay yeah that was the first one and i was i remember watching it like i was i think i was on the floor in the living room with my parents and my mom was like did she yelled at my dad <laughs> <laughs> what is what is this movie <laughs> well that was like hardcore like it was almost softcore porn it really yeah. was oh, so, like, well, the version was. I was not expecting that no <laughs> well we have said all the buzzwords that's going to get this demonetized and <laughs> but you know what we have had fun i think oh totally yeah it's been a wonderful little romp through cinema and film and we, I think we, we avoided most of the politics so that we did wander. Well, we did wander a little bit, but you, you have to. I mean, when you're talking about include equality and inclusion, that includes being made to look stupid just like everyone else. Oh, we forgot to mention uh, Deadpool. Like, he's like one of my... Oh, favorite. Deadpool, yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, you know, I think he's technically bisexual or pansexual. Yeah. But uh, he's definitely not straight. <laughs> no, no, he's not. <laughs> No, he's not. And that's that's fine. Uh, Deadpool's another character that is ambiguous and undefined, and I, we love him. Yeah, and people are so mad that he's, like, not, you know, more, like, on screen. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, as soon as you do that, you ruin it. Like, yeah. Because, <laughs> again, it's about subtext and making him, you know, uh, a standard for most people. So you don't have to show him behaving in the most outlandish queer way. Well in order to make the point that he's queer like they went through that whole like that one scene with um him and his girlfriend where they're doing like the 12 months of christmas or whatever and mm -hmm. you know there's the one point where it's like oh national women's day and she's like putting the strap on on and so obviously he's a little queer yeah well it's like game of thrones for example you know we, uh they do a marvelous job of incorporating gay people, uh, queer people into the into the script, and no one even cares because right. that's the way George R. R. Martin wrote the character, and they don't portray them as outlandishly gay. The gay characters in there are just as manly or just as feminine as any other. They're not stereotypes. I mean, uh, Rimley Baratheon, who was you know he was warring with his brother and the uh, uh, Lannisters over control of the Iron Throne. He was gay, but he was very, very, very much a king, you know, until the damn Red Witch killed him. But we won't get into that. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, New York is getting a little loud here if you hear the sirens. I do. Yeah, that's, that's the city. Hold on. It's really, it's a little loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah so it's interesting we'll have to wait and see you know how they how films kind of handle it going out in the future i think 
the next generation once we get past this we're in this weird like cultural death space where like everything that's being made with like a lot of money is sort of like kind of like falling apart Mm -hmm. um i have heard good things about the house of the dragon on hbo but i haven't it's really good cool that's great i'm really enjoying it it's I'll um probably wait till it's like done and then i'll watch the whole season that, that's the and they're also making supposedly it's like hbo's trying to turn game of thrones into like a marvel-esque universe oh. but they're also making a story on dorn or uh house martel uh, which, you know, they're the only house in all of Game of Thrones, all of Westeros, that has, like, female secession. And females are equal in power to, from the get from the jump to men. And it's because, and they're going to tell the backstory of why they're that, that way. And so I'm really looking forward to that. It's nice. Yeah, HBO generally has always had a very high standard when it comes to the quality of their writing. They do a great job at their shows. Uh, Sex in the City, True Blood is still one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, I never, I never read the novels, um, and I really could not, I could never get over how much I hated Sookie as a character. <laughs> but she, Anna Paquin was kind of annoying. I, uh, I'll get that. But that's another one where queer I, characters were included very naturally. And Lafayette, no uh, Lafayette, and the vampires were bisexual all over the place. Right, totally. And that's fine. Right. Yeah, we also had, uh, you know, I didn't think about it, but, you know, also HBO, really early representation of homosexuals with, like, Oz mm -hmm. um, and some, uh, you know, well, I guess this, that was Showtime, but I'm thinking of uh, Queer's Folk. Which was Queer's Folk was great. Guys. Queer's Folk was so good. I, I know they redid it. I tried to watch a couple they episodes. They redid it? They redid it. Ooh. It's not, it's not the same story. It don't, <sighs> it, no. You gotta let that. You gotta let that be where it mm. was in the time. You know, the, L Word yeah. also. Although I don't know any lesbians like the ones that were presented in L Word. Most lesbians. I mean, there are very well put together lipstick type lesbians, of course, and probably more of those in L A than anywhere else. So it's probably pretty accurate. But most of the lesbians I know are just kind of like me, plain Janes, uh, chubby, just average people. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's like we're not allowed, like gay characters are not allowed to be average cis, you know, at least in it, it seems that that's kind of like the trend right now. Like they have to be like really effeminate or like super like obvious or like, you know, really butch or it, it's like you can't just have like a normal like gay character that's just like gay and like normal like you and i just just gay right just gay like like totally <laughs> like you know otherwise you, you like you wouldn't even really know unless you know you know I don't exactly know. It's, it's it's hard to write that kind of character too i guess because it's not what it's not what's expected but then mm -hmm. again you know as storytellers and, and creators we should use our the the power that we have to you know play with expectation and make something new that may be a little bit more represent 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 eh, representative of reality it's just like uh, trans trans my i have a good friend also i'm also a stand-up comedian a fellow comedian uh her name is robin she's a, a male to female funniest woman ever and i will say that she she's hilarious but she talks a lot about her transition and but she she would never pick her out peg her out as being you know, have been a man before. I mean, she, I hate to use the word passes, but she passes, she passes. that well for her. You know, she's like Blair White. Pass. She passes really well, and you would never know. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the thing. If you pass, you pass, and nobody knows. And that's, and she doesn't want anybody to know. She doesn't put that out there unless she's right. dating somebody. Yes. She doesn't put that out there. She doesn't want anybody to know. Yeah. And then that, that makes sense. It's understandable. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I can't wait to watch. I have all these new movies to watch. I'm going to watch They, Them, Cruising, and what was the other one I got? Um, Sleepaway Camp. Sleepaway Camp, yes. I got that one. Sleepaway Camp is just camp, camp, camp. It's, it's about a camp, but it's also fully camp. It's very so I'll just, I'll just warn you. That's <laughs> fine. I just, I love, I love new movies and sampling films. And I love, I actually kind of love it when I heard that, like, I missed something. Like, this whole, like, Al Pacino gay thing. I can't believe you haven't heard of that. 
okay. my father, who was the straightest man that ever walked the face of the earth, loved that movie because he loved Al Pacino. I, I you know, I'm just like, Dad, it's a great actor. Yeah. Uh, so he's like, he'll always be Michael Corleone to me, but this is a good movie. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. I'm very excited to watch that one. Um, and then also this day them, because it's more of a modern take. So yeah. interesting to juxtapose. And I love Kevin Bacon. Like, I feel like Kevin Bacon, I like his, his body of work. I, I yeah. enjoy the film. Tremors yeah, yeah. to this day. Oh, one of my favorite sort of like culty horror movies. You know, you had Kevin Bacon, you have uh, Michael Gross, and you have Reba McIntyre and Big Worms. What more do you need? Yeah, Reba was so good in that as like, the dude's <laughs> wife. The big guns. <laughs> I loved it. And I mean, it's it's an interesting, you know, and it, it hadn't really been done, you know, this idea no. of monsters it, live under the ground. It was a take on the old 1950s monster movies, like alien monster type movies, and it was great. Yeah, it comes off as, you know, almost like it's like an action comedy. Like it's it's kind of like it's not really trying to be a horror <laughs> movie, but like it is, you know, at, at its root, but it's still very a lot of it's a lot of fun. Uh, that's how I feel about a Shaun of the Dead. I love Shaun of the Dead for what it is. Right. It's scary in parts, but for the yeah. most part, it's just funny. Yeah. Like <laughs> you, you could call it a zombie movie, but you know, it's it's obviously sort of a parody, but at the same time it manages to, <laughs> to be an entertaining zombie film at the same time. It's like, it's kind of like a zombie land, both of those. I put those into yeah. the same category. Yes. And the fact that, you know, that one was set in England and it showed what would happen in a zombie apocalypse where guns are not readily available like they are in the U.S. That, you know, they were throwing records <laughs> at the zombies and they were going through, okay, uh, you know, no, not that one, not that one. Batman <laughs> soundtrack, throw it. I was like, I like the Batman soundtrack. <laughs> uh, Danny Elfman is amazing. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh geez yeah no that's a, it was a good one i liked i liked that guy i can't remember what, it, what his name simon is. pig simon pig yeah yeah he's great i liked him as the uh the new uh mr scott in the the new star trek movies yeah he's yeah. really funny he does amazing just, voices he does amazing voices and he's just goofy looking i mean you you smile when you see him he has that kind of face you know yeah i really liked him in paul too that was another one i haven't seen paul Oh, that's a fun one. That's with him and the, so the same guy that plays his best friend in Shaun of the Dead plays his best friend in Paul. Mm -hmm. And the premise is they are English and they're going to San Diego Comic Con for the first time. And they're going to do like a tour, like a UFO hotspot tour, like mm -hmm. in, in a an RV uh, while they're here. So they do their little UFO hotspot tour and they sort of pick up an alien voiced by uh, Seth Rogen. And, you know, it's like one thing and then the alien is being pursued by agents um, and the, the one major agent, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's like a very famous comedy actor. Oh, what the F was he in? Oh, I'm totally blanking right now. But anyway, it's, it's a very funny sort of just like, like ridiculous series of events movies uh, and but, uh, Simon Pegg carries it all the way through. I, I love that. Uh, I want to check that one out. And there was one, I can't remember, where he decided, he woke up one day and decided he wanted to run a marathon and was training for it. And I can't I can't remember the name of it. I don't think... Run, Fat Boy, Run, maybe. Oh, What's the name of it? I have no idea. Run, Fat Boy, Run, Simon Pegg. <clears throat> uh, run, Fat Boy, Run. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Oh, that's one of his earlier films, it looks like. Yeah. Oh, Hank Azaria was in that, too. Yep. Yeah. 2007 that's also a man of a million voices <clears throat> yes yeah i was very upset when he decided to like leave the simpsons because he mm -hmm. couldn't do a poo anymore because people were offended by a poo uh, a poo the uh, least offensive thing ever i mean he was such a hard-working guy like mr a poo like he was a great guy he was a fun guy you know yeah i, I remember hank is there of course simpsons and he was on like Oh, we forgot the bird cage. Oh, the bird cage. Right. Yes. Speaking of Hank Azaria. <laughs> oh, I never thought that Hank Azaria, I mean, I know he's like of Cuban, I believe he's of a Cuban ancestry, but the fact that he played off the get, stereotypical gay Cuban pool boy, it was hilarious. Oh, he's so funny in that movie. That whole movie is just like nonstop laughs from start to it finish. Is. 
And it, it is it was made to be over the top. And if you make a movie to be over the top, make it over the top. Yes, the chemistry too, uh, Robin Williams and um, shoot, what's Nathan name? Lane. Nathan Lane, hilarious pairing them together especially like you know nathan lane's character like going through this like whole like emotional breakdown while the backdrop of like the family coming and the sun it's ah oh, so good and that was paul rudd too right was the was the son i believe so yes like the, it's so weird to think that was paul rudd and now he's like ant-man i don't know it's just and then uh oh calista plot card i think was the girl uh yes. alan mcbeal alan mcbeal yeah, that the, was an all-star cast, really. It was Calista Flockhart was the daughter who was getting married. Mm-hmm. And then it was... Uh, Diane Lane, who was Diane Lost Boys. Mary. Lost Boys. Right. Uh, and then who was the, the senator guy? Um, oh, that, oh, my God. Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman. Yeah, it's perfect. Playing a politi- like straight-laced conservative yeah. politician. Oh, my God. So that was definitely another... That was a big, big, you know, gay movie. And then uh, what was the other one that we forgot? Um, tu Wong Fu. Oh, yeah. Oh, just, oh, just to see Wesley Snipes and freaking Patrick Swayze in drag. Oh, oh my they, God. And they look amazing in drag. They look amazing. They're beautiful. I don't know if I would buy, you know, that they pass. But, you know, I can suspend disbelief for the purposes of the yeah. film. There's who cares i mean i have managed, right. exactly. i have i've managed drag bars and there are a lot of drag queens that play it for camp it's not really about passing they play it for camp like rupaul i mean rupaul does pass but he also can do a drag that is very campy totally yeah and that was actually the first sort of exposure and rupaul was actually in that film too mm-hmm. um and robin williams was too robin williams shows up a couple of times and the you know, he was a very big fan of the gays, I guess. I grew up in San Francisco. I think he lived in the Castro. He might have been, you know, bisexual himself. We don't know. Yeah, well, he also, we know he struggled with mental health and he ultimately, you know, took his own life. So it just, our people are prone to these problems, unfortunately. Yeah. It's just, it just comes with the territory, I guess. I don't know. It does. <clears throat> it does. I mean, a lot of it, but a lot of guilt, but we don't want to get into depressing subjects. <laughs> I love Robin Williams. I think another one of my favorite films of his is uh, the animated Aladdin. Mm-hmm. His vocals is just ugh, across the board. He does like 18 characters in that movie. I know. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Doubtfire. Mrs. Now, it's Doubtfire. not trans, but it is cross-dressing and gender-bending, and I loved it. And also, his brother was gay and was represented yep. in the film, you know, so... right. It's like a Hollywood makeup guy. Um, that guy was also, he's really funny too. I can't remember. He's been, he's, I don't really think he's in a lot of stuff. I can't think of his name. This is Doubtfire. Brother. Brother. Brother character. Probably his brother. Frank Hillard. Uh, yeah. Frank, his brother, Daniel Hillard. Da, 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 and that's the character's name. Uh, Yeah, it's not telling me the actor's name. And there's another um, real famous British crossdresser besides Eddie Azard, but uh, uh, Dame Edna. Dame Edna. Yeah, that's, that's he, Dame, I mean, he was so good. She was so good. She was knighted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Australian. Yeah, Australian. She was so good. She was knighted. <laughs> oh, good she is. <laughs> uh, woo. Barry Humphreys. Yeah. Oh my god, the wig and the glasses. Hilarious. And uh actually cross dressing's been around for a long time. I mean, let's not even consider that early Shakespearean actors were all played by prepubescent boys in drag, all the female parts, but you go to um early television, Flit Wilson was cross dressing as a character called Geraldine on his show for Many years, uh, you have Harvey Corman and Tim Conway dressing in drag on the Carol Burnett show. Um, <laughs> uh, Martin Lawrence, <laughs> you know, and Martin. Uh, okay. So, Shanae. Yeah, so cross dressing is funny. Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, yes, like it plays with the idea that we have traditional dress that is associated with males and, you know, females and then 
your cross dressing, which is what makes it, you know, curious or interesting. And usually there's a, a reason for it, or you're doing it for effect or for comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'd like to see it. It's, it's definitely has popped up here and there. And it's weird now that it's sort of being mainstreamed as like this idea that we don't have, you know, dress that's appropriate for men or women. It's like, well, boys can wear a dress. It's like, yeah, okay, they can, but then they're cross-dressing and they're like, no, like boys can wear dresses. And it's like, well, which one is it? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> exactly. So it, it just, it's, it's like, they want to erase history. I'm like, guys, just. Exactly. And us growing up, we were, uh, you know, Bugs Bunny was cross-dressing right. in the old Looney Tunes cartoons. That's how I was first exposed to the idea of a man impersonating a woman was Bugs Bunny, Carol Burnett, Flip yes. Wilson, you know, Martin. And I was Mrs. Doubtfire. I, I was fine with it. And then I think that is still how we need to expose, if we're going to expose children to that at all, I think that is the more appropriate way than taking them to an actual drag show. <laughs> Having managed a drag club, you do not want children to see what goes on behind the stage at a drag club. No, definitely not. I mean, we have a we have a really cool drag bar here in New York. It's uh, just across town from me. It's called Lips, mm -hmm. and they do a wonderful drag brunch every weekend. And the drag shows are bawdy and raucous and sexual and drug referencing, and mm -hmm. they're amazing. And we love them. And they're not for kids. <laughs> no, it's like taking them to burlesque or taking them to a strip club. Yeah, I mean, well, you, I, and this is the thing: like parents, you know, we have to we ha we as a society have to be like parents, like stop like you can't take your kids to the strip club you can't take your kids to the drag bar you can't take you know like like i remember a few years ago one of the reasons i actually started like having an online presence and making videos was because i saw little desmond is amazing on stage at a bar here in brooklyn in the city stripping you know taking dollar bills and taking off not he didn't you know do a full like strip or whatever but like was taking off articles of clothing and getting in exchange for dollar bills that were being flung at him I would never, if my son, if my son wanted to do drag, he could do drag all he wanted at home. Yes. And I would dress up with him and I would dance with him and we would have a good time. And then when he turned 18 or, or 19 or 20, go for it. Adulthood. You know, adulthood. adulthood. Go for it. it. You know, no. No. Yeah. But now and like, and they went from, it went from that it's like the video went viral and then all of a sudden he's like being interviewed by the New York Times and NBC and he's on the Today Show doing the rounds and then he's on the Michael A. Lake podcast. And I mean, I don't know. So Michael A. Lake was convicted murderer and drugs dealer, and gay dude. And his mother was like super big fans of Michael A. Lake. And so she was just really excited when her little Desmond could be on the podcast. Well, see, in that case, I think it's more the mother. Yeah. And, you know, come on. It's a drag drag housing by proxy yeah i'm just like <laughs> well and so like and he, i you know i he, one of the videos that i did you know desmond said that you know he knew it at two when he was watching rupaul that he just wanted to be you know a drag kid i was like yeah of course if you're two yeah. you're, and you're watching rupaul and rupaul made me want to be a drag queen right, right? come on <laughs> exactly it's just and there is such a thing as a drag king a lot of people don't realize that it's not as well known but there are women that impersonate men some of them do it very well yep totally and there are also i've seen straight men do the drag king thing too mm -hmm. which is rare but also you know it kind of like has it's very common i guess in like male performers especially like musicians mm -hmm. uh I dated a guy once who was kind of ambiguous <laughs> yeah well i mean he I, he he would identify as a drag king because he would there was some of the some of his shows he would get you know like like a lot of regalia going on a lot of makeup and big outfits and huge boots and all this stuff yep. um because the idea was to be more you know like to enhance your presence to draw more attention to yourself he was already a tall guy so he didn't really have to work that hard but yeah it's funny funny times in new york yeah. city exactly and we as gay we love cross-dressing it's a it's an age old art form we love it just don't take your children to it not for kids Please. not for kids unless it's a mrs doubtfire-esque show in a non-bar setting 
that's the only time I would ever allow a child to see it. Yeah, I don't even, I, I don't even just, I don't like it at all. Like, I just feel like drag is not for children at all. I'm like, just, you don't need to, like, this whole, like, in New York, they've got, like, something like, you know, a couple hundred public schools, and they've got this whole thing with, like, the drag queens coming into the schools to talk to children about LGBTQ plus A, you know, whatever issues. And I'm just like, can they not be yes. that outreach, you know, point of contact between the community and and children like can we not can we not do that like i'm like these a lot of these people are like you know not not to drag drag workers or you know drag queens but a lot of them are you know sex workers a lot of them are involved in you know drug activity um and these are not the people you want to hang around your children so it's just not so great <laughs> right exactly <laughs> like it just doesn't make sense to me why they want uh, to have a bunch of you know like out of anyone from the gay community like why can't you have like gay business owners or like gay politicians or like you know gay doctors <laughs> it's exactly like, no, let's exactly. Have the queens and like i'm like oh God. and i know a lot of drag queens that would agree with you <laughs> yeah a lot a lot of them do and I guess uh, you know part of it is that there's you know there is money to be made there and it's so a lot of a lot of these people can't turn down gigs too that's the other thing yeah so there, if there's demand for it it will be filled by somebody who desperately needs the gig me, me as a stand-up comedian i performed in, in and around new york performed in la or don't bring your children to my comedy show it's not appropriate it's full of sexual innuendo and they just don't need to hear it yeah, it's the other thing on the like comedy, like late night comedy shows are, are again not for kids. Yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. won't find children here, generally speaking, which is just so weird that like there's this one thing where they want to like take it out of the nightlife culture where it normally is and put it into a classroom. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I guess we're gonna have to wait and see. We'll have our first uh drag queen killer, you know, horror film at some point. That would be, it'd be great. Just write it well. You know? right? Give yeah. me a lesbian killer. Somebody out there, give me a lesbian killer. Maybe I should just write it. Maybe Ridley and I should just write it. Yes. Oh my God. You, me, and Mikey. I feel like we yeah. could definitely collab on something where I have a couple of like horror stories brewing in the back of my head. I had one that I kind of came up with over the lockdown period, which was all like about, you know, a pandemic culture and like a serial killer in a, uh, apartment building during like a lockdown scenario oh that's awesome well i was like you know we were all like locked down in the building and i was like you know it would be weird if like somebody in the building was like a serial killer and they just started like, <laughs> and you couldn't get out because like, people there's a there's a pandemic or whatever but anyway thank you so much for having thank you for being on me Let me i'm right. gonna do my outro here and uh thanks everyone for joining us i'll be back really really soon please go over and subscribe to uh Brantley's channel, A uh, Dangerous Rhetoric. I'll link it all below. They're almost at a thousand subscribers. We need to get them there, get them over a thousand so they can get some of this high dollar YouTube coin. Woot. I roll. Uh <laughs> Definitely. Please subscribe. We're so close. We're like 930 something yeah. hovering yeah. around there. So uh, go over and subscribe to them. And I'll be back real soon with another video. Until next time. Keep on crying. Thank you.